good afternoon. I'm joined today with Steve Hendel, who some of us know as Stitch. Stitch is the Senior Director, Global Security for Sykes. Good afternoon, Stitch. Thanks for joining me today to have a conversation with Cisco's CISO Advisors. Stitch, tell us a little bit about you and your organization, Sykes. Sure. Yeah, no worries. Um, as, as you mentioned, I'm the Senior Director and the Head of Global Security for Sykes, um, and uh, we're a BPO, a business process outsourcer, um, truly multinational all over the world, um, just shy of 60,000 people um, in almost every country you can imagine, truly east to west, north to south. Um, and we service a lot of the big brand clients all over the globe. Um, so when you're, when you're talking or interacting with them, you're likely interacting with somebody from us. Today's about talking to new and aspiring CISOs, and they're going to be watching this video. So one of one of the things we find very inspiring is the story of somebody's personal career journey. So can you tell us about your journey to the role of Chief Information Security Officer? Sure, absolutely. Um, hopefully I'll keep it inspiring and not frighten anyone away from a future career in cybersecurity, but who knows? Um, it's a wild ride. Let's, let's get going. Um, yeah, I, so I, I I'm here in America. Um, I am an American as of a couple of years ago, um, but originally uh, I'm from the UK. Um, I was born in the northwest of England and, uh, and lived most of my life up in Scotland, uh, which is where I called home before I came here to, to sunny, no tax Florida. Um, and so my journey has, has kind of been all around the globe. Um, I started when I was younger uh, working for the uh, British and Scottish governments. Um, one of the first jobs I had was with the British government. and um, it led me into a very structured, very regimented, very uh, closely ruled um, uh, work life. Um, and uh, and that kind of formed my my initial years and a lot of my rebellion, I guess. Um, and I truly uh, I truly became somebody that believes in flexibility. Um, i've uh, I've also, in my personal and private time, I, I spent my time around people. I get energized and charged by by people and by conversations like this. You know, if you look at, if, if I, that's that's the start. If you look at the end where I am now, I've built my entire life and my entire career um, around people. Uh, and I mentioned that, you know, Sykes, who I work for, my employer is a, you know, 60,000 people company all over the globe. It wasn't when I first started. I was started with a small family run organization called McQueen, um, who, who built and formed the first ever contact center in the Philippines. You grow and you grow exponentially and you find that your, your core skill, a, a people skill, communication skill, um, is the thing that really stood me well throughout the rest of my career. Uh, and a lot of what you'll, you'll hear me say today um, tends to come back to that point around communication, around building those relationships, being open, being transparent. And I've always been transparent, as, as you know, um, in, in a lot of what I, what I say and, and what I do. It drives me uh, and my core beliefs. Um, so, you know, working for the governments, you know, I worked for... I worked for and did some engagements with the military and defense contractors and, and the intelligence community. Um, and, and then I ended up working in IT uh, of all places, uh, which is the not, not necessarily the most people centric role and job in the world. You spend a lot of time watching progress bars go across screens. And, and I'd never have imagined when I started in security, which was very much people focused and behavioral focused and less about technology, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was more about the people and we've kind of come full circle. We've gone all the way around. It's been all about technology. And then it's coming back to, well, there's always a person at the end of the chain or the beginning of the chain. Um, so it's it's the circle of life, Simba. Uh, that's kind of how it is. Um, and that's that's been that's been my journey. So from IT in this little contact center in Scotland, one day I had a I had a knock on my door. And this was the pivotal moment for me of when I moved out of every experience I'd ever had. And I, I saw that shining light at the end of the tunnel, which was the train that had security written on the top of it. And, um, and I, you know, I got a knock on the door and from a, a couple of, uh, a couple of bobbies, a couple of, uh, cops, uh, boys in blue, um, and girls in blue, um, who, uh, one of each, in fact, who, who asked me, you know, could I help them? And, you know, I, I was used to dealing with law enforcement, obviously with, with the background that I had. And, uh, and so I said, yeah, absolutely. Whatever you need. Um, how, how do I help? How do I assist? And hopefully not not like this and walking walking away out the door. Um, and they they just asked me. They said, look, we we've got an individual that we need you to look into. Uh, we just need to know what what they're doing. What if you can see anything unusual? That was how they phrased it. Can you see it? See or tell us anything unusual? 
Sure, okay, no problem. Uh, oh, can you do it quietly? Never really been known for doing things quietly, but I said, I'll give it my best shot. So um, so I, I spent the next few days just digging in, looking at logs. Nothing, nothing interesting. I don't want to make this sound exciting. It's, it's not exciting at all. You're looking at logs, you're looking at, looking at data. Um, and one of those key pieces that, that we found was it was just a, a little strange. This guy was, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not one to judge anyone, as you'll hear later in our conversation, I'm sure. But, you know, I, they, this guy was a little bit, a um, little bit promiscuous, picking people up, doing things um, online and obviously in person. But my goodness, he, he, had, a, he had a rotation that, um, you know, uh, really envied Casanova. And I was, uh, and when, the, when we regrouped with law enforcement, I, I said, this is what we found. I don't think there's anything bad about it. Yeah, we, we all, each to their own, right? Don't knock it till you've tried it. I don't think there's anything bad about it, but that's, that's what I've got. Um, how did you get it? Oh, I've noticed he's on these forums, on these bulletin boards, and he's, he's really using it as, you know, speed dating. Well, the events of later that day was that they marched, they marched upstairs um, in our building, handcuffed the guy, took him away, and on the strength of the evidence that I was able to gather for them, and presented as a star witness in court, um, or an expert witness, as you Americans call it. Um, that was where they uh, they caught and they caught one of one of Scotland's most recent um, serial killers or mass murderers. Fascinating, just fascinating. So let's move on to what is your biggest challenges of today uh, that you face as a system now? Sure, and I think that really all comes down to um, to what we talked about about change, right? Um, the threat landscape, the the sophistication of the 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 attackers, the the threat circuit, it's all changed. We are not uh, as a as an industry, as a globe, as a consumer, as a user, as a security professional. We are not where we were two or three years ago. We we weren't. The dynamic, that the entire dynamic has shifted. Um, so, you know, the, the the tech stack that we have to secure. Um, has grown and it's become more complex. Uh, the tools available to us have become more complex and not simpler, right? You know, you look at your you look at your cell phone. Cell phones, you know, going through the the eighties, they, they they were really huge. Nineties, they began to get smaller and smaller and smaller. I remember a, a gentleman, one of my early mentors, a gentleman called Les Torrance. Um, he, one day he came into the office and he had this tiny cell phone. It was like this big. I, I think you can actually see it in Zoolander. Um, it had this tiny, tiny phone. Um, and uh, when we were working with Motorola and Nokia um, at the time, we, we got access to all this technology. And then, you know, and then now cell phones are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now, you know, my wife, who's a, who's a tiny lady, she has, she has this giant cell phone because she likes a big screen. Um, and, you know, it's like everything's changing and it's changing in a way that we just couldn't foresee if we'd, have, if we'd gone back five, 10 years. Um, and the threats that we're trying to defend against, turning it all the way back and keeping it, you know, within the realms of security, are increasingly sophisticated. The attackers are increasingly sophisticated, and everybody's a target. If we think of cybersecurity attacks and ransomware, um, they're not just targeting governments. They're not just targeting, you know, uh, defense or, or departments of state. They're 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 going after healthcare, right? And they're going after small and medium-sized sized businesses. The amount of ransomware attacks and ransomware payments paid by small and medium-sized businesses is staggering. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the way to think about that, and it sounds so depressing, is nobody's safe. Everybody's a target. And that makes you think, oh, my God, that's, that's so, so dull. It's so, so morbid. You know, why, why on earth would you continue being enthused and still have a smile on your, your face when talking about security? And it's because we can make a difference. We as an industry can make a difference by changing the dynamic, by changing the paradigm, um, and by working together. Uh, you know, security organizations working with different companies. Uh, we actively work with the security organizations of our competition, sharing information openly um, because we're all in the same fight. We're all in this together. You, me, everybody, vendors, customers, or then customers and clients and, and service organizations, MSSPs, we're all in the same fight. Uh, it goes back to your, your I, I have a I have a degree and background in counterterrorism and some experience in the field, uh, writing research papers and, and dealing with um, with radicalization. And everybody's in the same fight. We're all in this together. We should share openly like a giant fusion center of knowledge. And if we did that, you know, the bad guys wouldn't necessarily have anywhere to hide. 
Um, we'd know what they do, how they do it, why they do it, the TTPs, the IOCs, um, you know, tactics, techniques, and, and it, you know, indicates a compromise. Share them all openly. There's, there's no sense in keeping them. It's not proprietary. We're all in the same fight. Um, so that's, that's it. It's all about change. And it's really, that's where the biggest challenge is because you've got to keep up and you have to adapt. You have to, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Bruce Lee, you have to bend like a reed in the wind or Firefly if you're into that kind of thing, but it didn't uh, end well for the pilot. Um, so, you know, it's that's really where you've got to, you've got to focus. You have to be adaptable. Um, and your security strategy has to be adaptable um, because these are, and they will continue to be times of change. So let's, let's talk about this. How are you fostering a culture of diversity and inclusion on your security organization within your team? Sure, uh, it's the it's the topic de jour. I I, th I feel like I've I've, ans I've answered or been asked or talked about this this question, um, I, and that makes it sound or that that makes it sound like I'm diminishing the question. I'm not. What I'm trying to say is, as a security practitioner, I'm talking about this all the time, um, and we should all be talking about this all the time. Uh, we should drive, you know, women in cybersecurity. We should drive minorities in cybersecurity. We should drive inclusion across the spectrum. No matter whether it's gender identity, no matter whether it's sexuality, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I've, I've always been uh, very open about that, creating a team, a department, a security organization that is a safe space. We're no longer built from, you know, teams and groups made of, you know, ex-military, and I, don't get me wrong, I hire a lot of veterans, but, um, you know, it's not that military mindset of you've got to be tough and you've got to present this brash exterior and you've got to be loud and you've got to hit them hard and all this kind of stuff. That isn't the modern day security organization. The modern day security organization looks like everybody else. It looks like the people we're trying to secure. And as a leader, you have to drive that culturally across your entire teams you have to create a space that's open and safe for everybody to join you or for people within your organization to come out and come up to you openly with their challenges that they may be facing whether it is imposter syndrome whether they feel like they're not good enough whether they're they're having issues or, or, or concerns with themselves that they feel like they can approach you with be open um and you know within the lgbtq community which our security organization is, is led from the top. I am a member. I'm not just an advocate or an ally. I am, I am LGBTQ as well. Um, my son uh, is transgender. And before this call, I, I even said to him, like, look, you're, you're part of my life journey. Um, and I said, you know, are you confident? Are you comfortable if I, if I talk about you on this call? Because you formed part of who I am and part of what my, my belief system is. And he said, absolutely, Dad. I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. No worries. I'm standing at your side, even though he's, he's not. I feel I feel him with me because he's part of my journey, um, and uh, and I'm in a I'm in an interracial uh, marriage. My my partner is you know is is truly critical to to my entire life, um, and and her culture and her background is completely different to mine. Um, and uh, and so you know we we have to we have to be open culturally. You know it, I say that from a position that you know I'm my organization is spread all across the world. Uh, from all sorts of different cultures, all sorts of different nationalities, all belief systems, all all manners of, of gender, non-binary, um, and you know, sexuality, uh, and it's and it's important that that shouldn't be discussed as something that's new or something that's um, different or something that we should change and and suddenly adopt this. We should always have been doing it. Forty percent of my team are female. Um, and that's that's just because a lot of and, and we're trying to we're trying to improve this through through efforts such as the Diana Initiative and Women in Cybersecurity. We're trying to drive more adoption from from minorities and people who don't think that this is just a place where ex cops and soldiers go to hang out in the private sector. It's absolutely not. We'll take you from all walks of life. Come and join us. Come on in. The water is lovely. My my best investigator was a former school teacher and a Disney character actor. I hope you're okay with me saying that. Um, I'm not going to tell you which Disney character, um, but he became one of the best investigators and, and interview and interrogation teams that we've ever had. Um, and he was a, a school teacher who taught, uh, taught English in Korea. And, and we hired him the first time we met and we thought, fantastic, this guy's, this guy's great. We need to bring this guy on. Uh, he's also a member of the LGBTQ community. And so you've, you've just got to, you recognize talent, you hire that talent, 
I don't, I don't care where you're from. I don't care who you sleep with. Um, I, I, I don't care what you do at night. I don't care what your belief system is. As long as your core ethical structure is, you know, you've got to be Bill and Ted. You've got to be excellent to one another. And, and we all are all striving for the same mission, secure the world, make it a better place. We're all in it together. I hope it helps. Well, it's a bit of a rambling answer. It's a long road and a long journey, right? But I, you know what it, it is? It's, it's passion. No, it's a passion about the subject, Stitch. And and quite frankly, I love your attitude and the way that you feel like it should be embedded in everyone's thought process. I, I just admire that so much and I believe in it. I'm I'm but I, you know, I'm coming at I'm this just, from the position of a white male in a leadership position. So that's shaky ground, right? Um, I mean, it really is. It's shaky ground yeah. because you know you, you can look at me and you can look at the amount of privilege I've had to get to this point. Um, my family were poor when I was growing up. I, I've made my own way. I, I paid my own way through university. Um, I have. I, I got my degree, you know, on my own back, working on with the with the company that I was working with at the time. And Sykes has supported me in, in everything I've ever done on that learning journey. Um, but as a as a white male in this industry. It is it is a, a weak position to talk about inclusion and diversity, but it's also a position where you can make the biggest difference, but only if you believe in it and only if you're not paying it lip service. You have to truly drive that. Um, and like I said, 40 percent of my team are, are female. It's, it's not a statistic I throw out there lightly. We've, it's not something we took a deliberate step to say we are hiring women. We're not hiring men into this role. It just organically happened. And I still think it's not enough. Um, and we have transgender representation in my team, um, and, and we've we've fostered that in in our communities as well, speaking out in, in groups and being part of the the community. Uh, again, like I said, LGBTQ in our team, you know, comes from the top. Um, but you have to drive that. You have to, and it's it's not something that should be optional. It's not something that you should take up as a fad or the latest media management or leadership trend. It should just be part of who you are. Um, and and crunch those metrics. Look at that data and question yourself, question your organization and, and, and try and ask yourself if you're really doing enough. And the best place you can go to find out is go to LinkedIn, go to Twitter um, and take a look at the number of people who are saying as, as women or as, or, or as members of the LGBTQ community, they're saying, I want to break into cybersecurity. I want to get in there, but I'm, I'm really nervous. I don't know how. I don't think I'm worth it. I don't think my background's good enough or I've heard it's not very welcoming. That was the worst thing I ever heard recently or read in a post. It's like, it's not very welcoming as a community. And I thought we can do better. And I think Pam, my message to everybody is, if you want to talk about gender inclusion and diversity and culture on your team, we can do better. We can do better. And if I can help you in any way, I'm right there beside you. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the business and how it's important that you foster communication with other groups in your organization to get them to buy into the embracing security. Can you talk a little bit about that? So I'm a big fan of circular stories. Um, it's actually part of our psyche and how we're, how we're built and, uh, and hypnotism, which I've also tried um, not very successfully, although I did lock my friend's hands together once. Um, but it comes back to that whole thing about communication, being open, being transparent. Um, so it's a, at a business level, especially in security, when you're trying to gain buy-in from your stakeholders or anything else, you, it's about partnership. You have to come at it from a position of advocacy. You have to come at it from a position of partnership and influence. Security is no longer the department of no, and it shouldn't be, um, and it should never have been. Although you know it was, it was the part of the growth that, we, that we've all gone through. We were once labeled as security as the sales prevention organization. That was. It was one of the most damning labels I ever had thrown at me uh, where I thought, nah, this has to change. You've got to change. You've got to be better. Um, and it's it's an evolution. It's a journey. It's not something that, that ever stops. Um, but it's about partnership. It's about influence. And if you can, if you can understand the room, and, and by that, I don't mean the meeting room, you're in the Zoom room you're in, or, or the conversation you're in, Understand the room. The room is your, your organization. Take the time to understand what drives decision making in your company or in the industry you're trying to break into or whatever it may be. Take that time because only then can you truly be a partner 
Because if you don't understand where the other side is coming from and you don't take the time and you don't just sit and listen and you're too busy talking and making it sound like you're the smartest person in the room, then you're not coming from a position of openness and understanding. And that's what the business wants out of a security organization. They want a security organization that will take the time to understand the business, that will then sit down and partner with the business and partner with their clients and with our customers to be able to deliver a more secure and uh, hopefully reduce the risk to the organization through that delivery of a better and more secure way. Um, if you if you look at things from a Buddhist point of view, it's the middle way. There's always the middle way, right? It, it's very much take a look, listen to what you're really being told uh, directly or indirectly, and then find the middle way. That's what security should be focused on. Be that partner and understand your business. Yeah. yeah. Do I, I you think, think right. that your background in comedy and acting, do you think that helped you at all? Actually, I can see where you're going. I see the, the path you're taking. And the, and the real short answer is no. Uh, it's actually the opposite. Um, I was, so I'm, I'm very much, a, like I said, a people person. I'm outgoing. I was the kid in school that always ran his mouth, right? And you don't associate running your mouth with active listening, right? Or, or even listening in general. Um, and certainly stand-up comedy and everything else, if you're still in front of a, an audience or if you're performing, because that's what we all do, right? In business meetings or anything else, we perform, we, we get up there. We, and, and it's all about being in the limelight. And actually, um, over the course of the last five years, really, as I've, as I've grown, in, and grown and progressed in my career up these leadership roles um, towards that head of security where I am now, um, the key piece around that is I've had to learn how to listen. And that comes even more ironic from a guy who's actually deaf in one ear, um, because I, I have trouble tuning out background noise. So, um, so learning how to listen for me was a skill that I really had to develop. When you sit on stage doing comedy and, and somebody's heckling you from the audience, believe me, you hear every single word and it can derail you completely. That's not active listening. That's more just reactive listening. Um, but coming at this from a, a different perspective, I only really, I had a, I had a, a hallelujah moment. I had a, a, a real epiphany actually last year. Um, I, I became part of a, a, a leadership initiative and, uh, and, and gained a mentor, um, a, a gentleman called Joe Carella, who is the, um, the, the lead, lead psychology coach for the uh, Orlando Magic uh, basketball team. And, um, and he's, my, he's my mentor that's really changed my life because he said to me, you know, Stitch, you have this, this need to help people. And I do. If somebody comes to me and tells me something, I want, I want to try and help. I want to try and fix it, right? And he said, you have this need to help people. That translated in your mind and through your experiences as, as you, you know, you, you're the guy in the spotlight. And by making people laugh, because even in a serious conversation, I always try and keep it light and I always try and make people laugh um, one way or another. And maybe I fail miserably, but you can't please everybody all the time. Um, and he said, you know, you, you, you've taken that spotlight on yourself because you want to help people. And now in a leadership position, you have to shine that spotlight on other people. And that was a hallelujah moment for me um, because I'd been, I'd been learning more and more. I'm a, I'm a lifelong learner and you're, I'd been more in, learning more and more about active listening and creating this ecosystem of listening across my organization and my team and driving that message home. You know, to, uh, we used to be the guys in the room that would talk and talk and tell people how things had to be done, but no, nah, not anymore. Listen, listen, you'll find out how things have to be done because it will, it will present itself during the conversation. Um, and my, my leadership coach hit me with that really hard. And I said, but by shining that spotlight on other people, you're still helping. You're probably helping more than if you kept the spotlight on yourself. And, and that was the hallelujah moment. That was the moment where everything I've been desperately trying to achieve in my active listening journey, that's the moment where it hit home and it was like, I can make this shift and be okay with it. And I found better ways to articulate things. I found better ways of, of driving that message with my team. Uh, and, and that night after that session with him where I really, I really felt that, that change in me, um, I sat down over dinner with my family and, and we're all sat there. My son was talking and, 
and, and my wife was talking and, and normally I, I tend to lead conversations and I, I just sat back. I just sat back and I just absorbed the conversation. And even when there's moments of awkward silence, not just from chewing food, but even in those moments, I didn't, I didn't try and fill the void. I didn't try and fill the gap. I just sat there and let them happen and, and let them evolve into other things. And it hit me so hard in doing that. At that point, I, I got up, I hugged my son and I cried. And that's the point where I felt like there was something that connected the dots in my head that then allowed me to make a personal deep seated change that I could then better articulate across the organization. Because you can't articulate something if you truly don't understand it at a core level. You can fudge it. You can do your best. You can read as many books on the planet as you can. But if you don't truly understand it deep in your being, it's different from a technical perspective. But from a personal perspective, like you've got to listen more. You know, tell that to the deaf guy. See how he feels. I'll tell you, it doesn't always come across well. But I, I found that connection. And since then, my boss, my leadership team in the company I work for and my peers that I, that I interact with and They've said, you know, I've noticed the difference. That's the best compliment you can ever receive is when somebody says to you, I've noticed the difference. And when as somebody that talks a lot, you're in a room and somebody looks at you and says, Stitch, you're, you're not saying much. And in that moment, you know, you kind of sit there and go, it's OK, you guys have covered it all. I have nothing else to add. Instead of just chiming in with something because you've always been that guy that says something, right? Just finding comfort in knowing that you, you don't have to say something. Okay, so let's talk about the events of the past Come year. Come you're making it too easy for me. That, I know, well, you know. Uh, the past year, how has that influenced or transformed how you will move your business forward in the coming year or years? Oh, I mean, you talked a yeah, little bit about... How things have changed, but how how's that influenced you? Yeah, yeah, that's what I get for saying you're making it too easy for me. Um, the past year was one of the most difficult years of my entire career, um, and I have dealt with um, I've dealt with uh, civil uprisings, uh, the Arab Spring, um, uh, civilian evacuations from hot zones. Uh, <laughs> Fukushima nuclear disaster, um, which which my my compadres and comrades in arms at the time, uh, Tim and James, um, you know, we we were on the front lines of that and and managing those expectations. We had to become experts in in radioactivity and 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 find ways to communicate very complex things. Um, and you know, I've I've been through all of that, and then 2020, 2019, 2020 come along. And we've all got pandemic plans, right? We all have to have a pandemic plan. And I don't know a single person in the industry. And I've talked to James and a few other people out there that I, I believe are really trusted, you know, my trusted cohort across the world. And nobody's pandemic plan was prepared for an actual pandemic. H1M1 and everything were nothing. COVID-19 took the goalposts, threw them away, tore up the rule book. And everybody dusted off their pandemic plans and found that they were not fit for purpose. And, you know, they say no plan survives first contact with the enemy. I, I live by that. Uh, yeah, again, you have to be adaptable. Um, but any plan is better than no plan, right? But when your plan doesn't work, you have to be able to pivot. You have to be able to shift. You have to be able to take a different approach. We were very fortunate. Uh, the company I work for uh, was very fortunate in that we already had a uh, a strategy for work from home. We had work from home agents in our in our contact, or not necessarily in our contact centers, but servicing our customers from their homes. So COVID nineteen hit, and the first thing we did because we have we have sites in China, uh, Guangzhou, uh, Shanghai, and um, and we had to send people home quickly, rapidly to keep the lights on. Right, it's all about keeping the lights on, keep the phones ringing, keep the customers being serviced. We sent people home in such speed um, and, and, and so rapidly that our clients were, were, were quite frankly stunned that we, that we did so and we were able to, to do so quickly. And of course that then rapidly translated across the rest of the world in, a, in an explosive manner that nobody could prepare for. Um, and we had to push and push hard. 
and the IT organization had to build infrastructure or shore up infrastructure that wasn't necessarily resilient enough to be able to scale. Uh, and we encountered things that we could never have imagined that, um, you know, just just adding adding a tiny, tiny bit of, of, of bandwidth on an overutilized circuit, you know, anything that added 13 milliseconds of latency suddenly stopped, you know, voice interactions from working. Um, and, you know, all of those all of those links were already saturated. So we had to come up with innovative solutions and bounce traffic around in places that we'd, we'd never imagined. Um, so the, the past year showed showed me that my 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 ethos of being adaptable and being flexible um, it really came to light. And we I have to say, you know, everybody talks about COVID-19 and, and 2020 and, and the, the challenges of, of organizations. They talk about them in relation to, you know, uh, negative, negative consequences, negative, uh, negative aspects to it. But we actually came through um, the COVID-19 um, pandemic really quite well. We kept people working. We kept them in jobs and we allowed them to work from home. We, we had that flexibility that we, we were unable to do so. Um, and then mid 2020, just at the end of Q1, um, we got hit by a cyber event. Uh, and we were we were hit really hard. Uh, it, this is public knowledge; it's in our SEC filings as a public company. Um, but uh, but we were we were hit by ransomware. One of our clients was hit by ransomware first. Came to us, um, making us aware again, sharing knowledge transparently. It was it was it actually helped us a lot. We were already working with a cybersecurity organization, a cyber forensics organization to help us with that client's incident. Um, when our own cybersecurity event happens, they, the event that you, you, you hope never happens to you happened to us. Um, and, and again, relationships, partnership. We were very much partnering with, with that vendor at the time, and we've grown that partnership since then. We were so fortunate. We weren't on retainer. We didn't foresee that this thing was ever going to happen to us. Um, and it was all around communication. We pulled together tiger teams across the entire organization, operations, marketing, branding, legal, HR, communications, IT, everybody pulled together. And what we found was we were so lucky because most of the people in, in our organization and, and our peers that we interact with, we built those relationships. We built those partnerships. So when the, when the um, SHTF, when it all went down, we had people and partnerships and relationships. We had money in the bank that when we had to make a withdrawal and we had to ask people to dig deep for their time, for their expertise, for the resources, they gave and we gave and we all, we all participated. We all pulled together to get us through it. And the feedback from some of our clients, because we worked directly with the client security organizations, um, sharing information transparently as new IOCs and new things came to light from our attack. And the biggest thing that we found out of that was uh, that our clients told us that we handled the event better than most of, of our competition and most of the other companies that they work with. And that's not me blowing blowing my trumpet or blowing smoke up my kilt um, to, to kind of Scottish expression. They came to us and said, you were fast. Your communication was rapid. You know, you were talking to us every day. You were sharing things openly. You weren't trying to hide anything. You weren't trying to, oh, we'll get back to you. We'll get back to you. Right. We shared what we had and we told people we'd get back to them with more really shortly. That speaks volumes to your team and your leadership shadow that you've cast. In, because I know that, you know, it can be tiring. It can wear out people and the partnerships are crucial for those moments where you need to pull in others to help you and to share the messaging. Um, so it's great to hear that your company came together. I want people that are listening to hear this, like you've talked a little bit about technical acumen, but a lot of what you've talked about today is, is the soft skills that it takes to do your role. And I, I'm just, I'm just so proud of how much you've you've taken to heart what that means to the role and your organization so let's let's just pivot on that how how's the conversation with your executive staff and how do you measure success pre and post to inform them of your security organization and and the metrics that you have to provide them how do you measure success what does that look like 
the conversation that we have with our board and the conversation that we have with our stakeholders and with our customers and our clients has to, it has to, I don't want to say dumb it down, but it has to simplify because the, the, the threat actors are increasingly sophisticated. The, the technologies to, to manage and defend against that, to identify, detect, protect, respond, recover, all of that is, is increasingly technologically advanced and increasingly complex. And if you're trying to sell somebody on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, an initiative, a project, a technology, something that costs a lot of money um, or presents a lot of risk, and if you're doing that without data, it's just an opinion. An argument without data is an opinion, and uh, and and increasingly, in those conversations, no matter what they may be, whether it's uh, you know part of the sales cycle, whether it's whether it's a prospective client, whether it's an audit, whether no matter what it is, whether it's just sitting down with your board and looking at your numbers, um, cybersecurity or security in general is the forefront of the conversation and not the not the afterthought, right? Because we can all we've all been there, we've all been the afterthought. Right. And you look at any any organization sales deck or presentation deck on what they do, you'll find security is often an afterthought, but it's becoming more and more prevalent that it's it, it's in the forefront because we can be value add. We can be a business enabler and your board has to see you as a partner and they have to see you as an enabler of business and a growth factor. You can grow your business if you can talk about how you grow the business securely. Um, and that's that's really that's really where we are and where we've come from in talking with our stakeholders and our leadership and our clients and customers is is that you can't shy away from security. You have to be open and transparent about what you've got. There's no point telling everybody you've got the best security in the world and then getting hit by a cybersecurity event. Don't be that, don't be that person. Um, but you can do that with dashboards, with data, but that's okay, and you should, but data is pointless and insights are pointless if they're not actionable. You can't just throw a number or a pie chart or a graph up on screen if you're not telling the organization what value, whatever technology investment you've had uh, has brought to the company, or if you're not able to articulate how that data that you're presenting is driving action. And it has to drive action. So data insights should drive action. And that action should then further strengthen is continuous improvement, further strengthen your organization. That's the story you have to tell to your board and your stakeholders and your clients and your customers or your venture capitalists or whatever it may be that you're trying to sell your security on. If you don't become a good storyteller by having a good story to tell and some real narrative that is built upon the foundation of data and facts, then you're not going to win. You need better insights um, because you need to you need to increase confidence. You need to increase trust. You need to you need to be a partner on security so that you can then provide leading insight and then you can then secure the business and deliver a better experience for everybody. Because in security, we, we're not known for always delivering the best experience to our customers, clients, stakeholders, whoever they may be. Deliver a better experience, get people to trust you, be that partner. And if you can do that, the, any discussion, whether you're looking for more funding, whether you're looking for increasing your incredibly complex tech stack, or even just starting out down the path of an EDR, whatever it may be, if you mm -hmm. can increase trust, and you can tell a good story, get people bought in, start with why, right? Get people bought in, get them to become compassionate or passionate about what you do and become an ad advocate for what you're trying to achieve. And when they all figure out we're all in the same game and we're all trying to achieve the same things, then you'll have, you'll have your, your stakeholders on your side. You know, that's, that's actually a perfect answer. Storytelling without this, the theater behind it, right? Make it relevant to them and, with data, I, I just love that answer. That's, that's a fantastic answer. I hope I hope people take that away. So, if you could go back to your younger self and give him a piece of advice, what would you say? And uh, just a little bonus part, what would you say to the next generation of security professionals listening? Okay, um, so time travel now. We're we're in uh, we're in security inception. Um, time travel. Okay, great. Um, or Christopher Nolan's tenant. Let's take it that way. Uh, 
Yeah. Okay. What would I tell? What would I tell me? Um, I would tell me, don't be afraid. Um, don't be afraid. Take take the decisions you're going to take, but don't change a thing. Don't change a thing, because future me wouldn't be here today with the life experiences as 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 troublesome as it may be to you at the time. You're still alive. You're still here. Don't change a thing. But listen more. I mean, that's that's what I would tell myself. And then if you want to take that into what advice can I give people coming into the industry is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Coming in, the water's yeah. lovely. Dip a toe. You might find you like it. And you might not. And if you don't, don't worry about it. It might not be for you. It might, you, might be, you might be heading down a different path. Whatever life has in store for you, find the middle way. It's the best way to do it. Excellent advice. Well, Stitch, I feel like we got a lot of advice from you today and it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you for doing this with the CISO advisory group. We really appreciate you taking the time today. No worries. I hope we've all become friends. We can all lean on each other in the future and share things openly. And like I said, we're all in the same fight. So.